So, um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch it around a little bit. We're going to start um, the regular board meeting to a certain point, and I'm going to stop it, and then we'll do the budget workshop at that point, and then go back to the regular meeting. It'll be as smooth as anything. We'll see. Okay. So at this point, right? Um, <laughs> Being that it's your birthday tomorrow, you know. Yes. Yeah, you follow along. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so at this time, I will be calling the uh, Rampart Central School District Board of Education meeting Tuesday, April 4, 2017, to order that the record reflect again that all board members are present. Can everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Chief, what? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And welcome. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Things have been a little slow lately, but activities are coming up. Yesterday, there was a guitar festival at SHS, and many musicians were able to show their talents. Um, SHS and the Manza will be tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. in the auditorium. Uh, SHS string extravaganza will be on Thursday, April 6th at 7.30 p.m. There will be an ACT exam administered on Saturday, April 8th. On April 20th, the STIR class will have its annual symposium uh, in Southern High School's library at 5.30 p.m. Students will give poster presentations and seniors will have PowerPoint presentations. Our guest speaker this year will be Dr. Dorothy Petit of Lamont Darty, who will be discussing about the environment during the Ice Age. Uh, an email was sent to all board members and we hope everyone can attend. Thank you and have a great spring. Thank you. Okay, 1.08 minutes to the regular meeting of March 21st, 2017. Chair, we again a motion to accept those minutes as so stated. So moved. Greg, second. Motion. Clark, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Unanimous. So moved. Okay, superintendent's comments. Uh, we have uh, some recognition tonight. The first group of students I'd like to recognize are the national merit semifinalists and commended students. Mr. Green. I don't really need this, so <laughs> I shouldn't need this. Uh, my honor tonight to uh, introduce uh, our Board of Education to some wonderful students uh, and recognize their academic achievement. I'd like to begin with the uh, 2017 National Merit Commended Students. Uh, the following National Merit Commended Students uh, placed in the top 5% of the 1.6 million students uh, who entered this competition through their performance on the preliminary SAT. Uh, they certainly demonstrated outstanding potential for future academic success. And they are, and please come forward, uh, Adriana Owen. John Poulos. Staying up there, we're going to grab a picture. Uh, Adrian Ramon. And 
Lucy Rice, who's not here this evening, she's attending a college visit, but I promised her I would mention her name. <laughs> um, so you can clap for Lucy. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce our National Merit finalist. Uh, this uh, finalist placed in the top half of 1% with the same 1.6 million students who qualified through the PSAT. Uh, and being selected as a finalist in the National Merit Competition opens the door uh, to a plethora of scholarships and opportunities uh, through the National Merit Scholarship Clearinghouse. Uh, this student is to be recognized for distinguished performance uh, and future academic accomplishment. And this is Katrina Keene. Eagle Scouts. So John, if you'll come back up. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Jared. And the uh, project that these two did, different projects, uh, are really amazing. And I don't think I would do justice to describing the projects that they did. They got a lot of volunteers. They raised money to do the projects, and the excess funds are going to worthy causes. And so, before you get your certificate here. John, if you would explain a little bit about your project. Okay, so my project was a Veterans Memorial at American Legion Post 859 off on Pavilion Road off of uh, Route 202. Um, so what I did for that is over the summer, uh, I raised money through a letter writing campaign uh, and was able to coordinate with uh, vendors and other workers, um, uh, bringing my project together uh, where I removed mulch, uh, and laid pavers in a Belgian block border, as well as installed a four foot uh, granite memorial uh, for the American Legion. How many volunteers did you have? I had 55 total, um, and in particular, what I'd like to say is I want to thank uh, my Eagle advisor, Mrs. Martell, for help guiding me through my project. Wow. Sure. Um, so I constructed a uh, three dog decks at the Hudson Valley Humane Society, a local animal shelter located in uh, Pomona, New York. What I did was, uh, basically they already had pre-existing decks constructed there and they needed more of these decks as uh, more people wanted to come in and adopt more dogs and they were getting more pets coming in. So I decided, you know what, why not provide them a new resting place for all of these dogs to come together to have fun and create new friends, uh, as silly as it may sound. <laughs> these new dogs like to play with each other and like, ha like to have a good time. So what I did was with 36 other volunteers and including with the amazing help of Mrs. Martell as well, I was able to make this Eagle Project happen and it was an amazing thing to work through as well. Although it was very stressful, I'm proud to be an Eagle Scout standing here today. Uh, and I'm happy for everything that I've committed to Boy Scouts and the community all together. Pictures of these two great Eagle Scouts. And they were telling me beforehand that uh, the third Eagle Scout that we had recognized last year they all live on the same block. One house away. Thank you. 
Do you want to go back and take a picture with them as, as they're advising? Yeah, tell them. Yeah. Yeah. John, can I be on for that? taxes. Um, and a little bit of good news is the on again, off again world of Albany, I guess the Senate is passing bills tonight. The Assembly uh, is saying they're going to do it tomorrow. So at least before the budget is put to bed, we should have final state aid numbers uh, from the legislature. Um, as far as where they're at right now, both the Senate and Assembly passed one house bills, which increased uh, how much uh, the governor had in his budget for school aid by $239,887,000, respectively. We're still budgeting right now what's in the governor's proposal, which under existing law must be spent on school aid. Um, uh, obviously, we're, we're not at liberty at this point to go beyond that. Um, however, one of the other items that did uh, change since we first put the budget together is interest rates have gone up the Federal Reserve, and we feel we can comfortably increase that line item of revenue uh, by another hundred thousand dollars in our budget. Um, and if interest rates keep going up over the next few years, it will uh, become a more substantial part of our revenues. We had a 577,000 uh, shortfall uh, between our revenues and our expenditures awaiting the state budget. We now brought that down by a hundred thousand um, dollars. But we're still looking at that $477,000 figure, which we are hoping uh, comes in additional state aid uh, from Albany. But we will uh, react if it's not sufficient uh, with a plan to, uh, to bring everything into balance well before the 18th uh, meeting. Um, there was questions about the additional uh, course offerings and staffing uh, that are in the budget as it exists right now. So turn around. Yeah, thanks, Anthony. So just so the board has a sense of, from an overall perspective, we project the 
the staffing to be essentially the same in terms of overall numbers. Um, you know, there may be a slight increase or a slight decrease over the total of about 415 teachers that we have, but nothing substantial one way or the other as we're projecting this point at this point. Uh, it's not a surprise to anyone that you know, the continuing trend of enrollment has an impact on the number of elementary sections at this point that are needed to educate the students that we have. Uh, we're happy to report though that none of those teachers are going to lose positions as a result of uh, a number of factors including efforts uh, that have been made to make sure that there are available positions for them elsewhere and because they happen to be in each of these cases certified in other areas besides elementary education it allows us uh, to reassign them or reallocate them uh, to business to special education to mathematics and to uh, additional electives that we will talk about shortly uh, so while we will be down between three and four uh, FTE is full-time equivalent elementary sections. None of the teachers, none of the high-quality folks that, are, that have been doing this work will be excess or lose their, their job as a result of that. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you know, there's been a great deal of discussion about the pre-K program, and so we'll be allocating one or two FTE teachers to that, depending on interest and enrollment. Uh, in our part-time positions, we have about a dozen of. Those are one-year positions and reallocated and readjusted on an annual basis. We're going to see reductions in Mandarin, Italian, and art, and increases in French, <coughs> English as a new language, and in science. Uh, so overall, that will net out to about the same staffing that we have now. And also the board has obviously heard information about the creation of some new special education classes to serve students with a different profile of needs. And so per IEP, those also require uh, aid support, we actually go beyond that level and provide teaching assistant support with a certain lot of teachers. And so we'll be looking to increase our teaching assistant group by uh, two, one allocated to each of those new classes. What schools are seeing the reduction in first and fourth grade? Um, in first grade, it's Cherry Lane and Viola. Those have two section kindergartens now, so those two sections will work their way through the building. Uh, the fourth grade is at Slipper. There are no, no other questions. I'll transition to Lee. We'll talk about new and expanded opportunities for students in the session. So with that roughly equivalent staffing that uh, Steve mentioned, uh, we are offering new uh, courses and opportunities. We've discussed pre-K at length. I believe we've mentioned the bilingual kindergarten. Uh, that's still one that we're waiting for the enrollment numbers, but that's anticipated that and that would be at Connor. Uh, the special education classes that we discussed at the last meeting. At the middle school, we're also looking to offer electives for eighth graders to be taken as part of the Encore strand. Um, AVID, which is uh, similar to the AVID that is at the high school, but it's the developmentally appropriate middle school one. It previously ran at uh, Suffern Middle School and has been gone for a number of years, and we're looking, if there's interest and in enrollment, to bringing it back. Um, Excalibur is a new course. And I'm just, I need to check my notes because the X caliber stands for a whole bunch of words, which I can't remember all of them. <laughs> um, explore, create, analyze, learn, iterate, break, understand, and reflect. It really covers STEAM concepts through the design of video games. Uh, it will offer an understanding of new literacy skills for the digital age, such as programming and coding through an understanding of play and investigation of game genres and styles, plus the design and creation of a new video game. Students can take both Avid and Excalibur. A letter will be going out to the incoming eighth graders. So it's only for eighth graders. It's in the Encore strand. Kids have already met. Our students meet their requirements for music um, by the end of seventh grade. And so that they can take this instead of um, media arts or digital music, something like that. So it's a choice. They'll run if we have sufficient enrollment. They won't run if we don't have sufficient enrollment. That, le that leads to my question because I know, I think it's been out for six or seven years out of the middle school, if I'm correct. But when it first started the middle school, they kind of had to choose to give something up, whether it was an art or a music. And it ran in sixth, seventh, and eighth, or seventh, I believe it was sixth, seventh, and eighth. It's only for eighth grade. So it's, it's only, only for eighth grade. So that, so that question of those new kids coming in don't have to give up. No. Okay. So, but in eighth grade, they will. In eighth grade, they, they have a choice to, to take it. They will. They opt to take it 
and if they're media arts or digital music or their music class. Um, at the high school, we have a number of electives uh, being offered this uh, coming year. Um, cinematography, a number of the business classes, uh, college English, which is very, it's really a course we already offer, but it's being now offered at the dual enrollment level. So it's taking one of our courses and maybe in a dual enrollment agreement. I think that one's with Seton Hall. I have to double check that. Interior design, music in our lives, living by chemistry is a non regents chemistry alternative, and honors anatomy and physiology. Again, all of the electives are pending sufficient enrollment. The ones listed here at the high school, we believe we do have sufficient enrollment for. Is there a target number you're looking for? Um, it's, usually, it's usually in that like 22 okay. range or so. Um, you know, just because it, it needs to be enough that it's a class. Right. And most of these don't have prereqs. Some of the um, business ones may, and that one's anatomy and physiology may, but for the most part they don't have prereqs. Uh, what preparation do our teachers um, experience in order to teach? I know we have Abbott, but is Excalibur new and what? So Excalibur is new. Um, if it runs, it'll be taught by Peggy Sheehy, who is a leading a world leader in the area of education through gaming. So she's actually often the one who helps other teachers to do it. Um, Avid, we have two teachers who are trained from the previous iteration of Avid in the building, so it would be one or both of those two teachers who would teach. And you would have to take both? No. No. No, you would take one or the other. In fact, you can't take both. Oh. Okay. Yeah. And there will be many kids who take neither. Hey. This, is, this isn't similar to, because Peggy used to do something prior to this. Gaming. Is that Similar? No. This is, okay. this is a unique standalone quest. So, what is the financial impact with all the extended opportunities and electives? It was presented at the last workshop as a budget item, all these new electives. So, I mean, there must be some cost associated with it. Uh, very little. Um, in most cases, these are taking the place of other classes that aren't running. So for instance, all the business classes have just been made dual enrollment. They're being offered at the college level. Um, the English class, if you go back, was also one that it's a class we already offered. It's just being offered for dual enrollment. Interior design is taking the place of another facts class that isn't running. Um, living by chemistry is the non regents chemistry alternative. Um, so I mean, cinematography is just, it's an art class. There's no additional staffing being requested for it. So then just to confirm, all these electives that you're looking to introduce or reintroduce uh, will have, you, you don't need to hire anybody new. Right? No. It's all going to be taught by existing full-time employees. Correct. Okay, so there really is no cost. I have a question about the honors of and physiology. We've had an AP, um, an AP bio, but this is brand new, correct? Yes. And there's been a demand out in the, you know, higher education, and I know RCC had asked because of the nursing students coming in with this area being most challenging. Um, so is this college preparatory level? Are there any other college credits for it? I have to double check on my college credits. Um, I'm not sure. It is intended for students who may or who are not necessarily in the AP track to give them that opportunity to take an upper level class. Right. It, it, it's it's just to kind of fill that little void there. Right. And they go and then usually struggle with that specifically right. like if they're going into nursing or you know a lot So of this is more rigorous than regents, that's why it makes it on them. But maybe it'd be great if they also get credit. Yeah. That I I have to double check on that. All right, so the, uh, the budget boils down to the, we were looking, uh, looking for the board to approve three propositions this year. Proposition one is the same every year. It's the budget. And the dollar amount of the budget, while we have a dollar there, that's where it sits right now. That will be decided on uh, the next meeting on the 18th, so we are not really looking for any uh, final decision on the budget at this time. And obviously, we need to bring, this, bring it into, into balance. But that would be proposition one. Proposition two, 10 years ago, the voters approved a capital reserve of $8 million. 
there's still $1.7 million left in that capital reserve. And this allows the district to spend that money. So again, this is money that's already been set aside, no additional impact on the taxes. It doesn't affect the budget or the tax warrant or tax levy. Uh, but it will allow us to install and replace new air handlers at the, the high school that are original to the building. And also to bring generators into at least uh, the secondary schools in the central office building. Uh, currently there are no generators that we have and those would give us the capability to run the school through the day uh, if we had a power outage, um, potentially even to be a community resource if there's a long-term outage um, that affects uh, our community at large. So um, that would be uh, something that we would like to have action tonight to authorize that vote. And Proposition 3, um, over the last 10 years, the district has been able to handle all their building needs without borrowing money, which we have a very low debt ratio in this district, which is very positive. And we think over the next 10 years, we can similarly, you know, glean from savings uh, in our budgets enough to hopefully fund a new capital reserve of up to $10 million. <coughs> this would give us the authority to begin putting money aside for that purpose. In order to spend it, we have to come back to the voters to physically spend it on various purposes, just like we're doing for the air handlers. Uh, but we think by doing this, we, would, we can tell our community that we will not need to borrow money to take care of our roofs, our infrastructure, electrical upgrades. There's a lot of meat and potatoes type stuff here uh, that needs to get done one way or another. Um, and uh, every building is going to be touched to some degree. We also are recommending we continue to keep money in the budget for capital. We, we were doing 700000 this year. So if we keep that line item the same at 700000 over 10 years, we would have this 10 million, another 7 million. Uh, so really, we could take care of 17 million dollars worth of work, uh, which is pretty much in line with what our five-year capital review showed uh, should be dealt with. Um, and again, the majority, of, large percentage is, is roofs. Our high school, middle school roofs are over five and a half million, or about five and a half million of that total. And then we, we did provide a backup as to where the rest of it's going. We would prioritize upgrading fire alarms. That would be the first thing we do if we get this ability. It would be next year when we ask the voters to approve that. So that's what, um, how we'll be presenting the budget and uh, the propositions to have the whole plan in place uh, for going into next year. Any questions? So, oh, go ahead. Just to clarify, in case we don't understand the capital reserve fund, mm -hmm. um, it's the proposition is not to actually to put ten million dollars in there today or, no. or whatever. No. It's just to open up this this account, so to speak. Right. <clears throat> and then slowly but surely we can put money in. We can yeah. put money in without without voter approval, but we can't take that money out without approval. Exactly. So it's just really to set up this fund, but obviously this is the anticipated purpose of it. Yep. And the fund from the last time, the one from 2007, they expired, correct? Yeah, there was $8 million that was approved then, and those funds are now, after this 1.7, would be done. Right, but there's a certain point in time where you're not, you can't add more money to yeah. that particular fund. Yeah, and same with this, we have up to 10 years right. uh, is what this would be established for. Okay. So, and if at that point, if various economic things change and we, there's only $6 million in the fund, that's what it is, and that's what the district can spend. So that I just want to confirm the discussion we've had yeah. where I question what if there are other budgetary priorities, yeah. we don't have to put money that year into that fund. So that Most would be definitely. flexible depending on yep. financial status. Yeah, we're not committing future boards right. or future voters right. to really... So it's on a year-by-year -year basis that is. we evaluate. Yep, it just gives if us this flexibility. Surplus or no surplus. Yep. And based on the needs that we may have that arise in the district. Yeah, I mean, we're... You know, in the last seven years, we've been dealing with, you know, slowly increasing state aid, um, retirement system rates that have been flat and going down. We could be dealing with a lot of other pressures where in a given year, you know, we might not have the flexibility to do 700000 in the budget or to, to contribute anything more uh, in that year. But uh, we feel we this is attainable. But ultimately, your goal is to put aside in a perfect world, roughly yeah. one point seven million dollars per year. Right, seven hundred thousand that we would physically put in the budget right. and in effect tax for, 
and the, the, the so other and the other ten million, one million a year approximately would be gleaned from savings in the budget, revenues that came in a little higher, whatever. Right. Whatever so in, in, in reviewing the anticipated expenditures for that seventeen million, yeah. um, like you said, the majority of it is roofs. It's yeah. it's about seven point two million dollars in fact for all the roofs in the district, which is about forty two percent of that entire capital budget. So do you have a priority list already established for all these repairs? Mm -hmm. Just to make sure that you know the, the big ticket ones, for example, if it costs three million dollars to do soccer in high school, mm -hmm. right, it takes X amount of time to accumulate that money. Right. So can some can the big ticket items wait six years, seven years? That's a good question, and um, we do have a roof warranty at the high school and the middle school, which should take us out three to five years, and that shouldn't be the end of the life. Right now, we do have priorities, kind of, actually the architects themselves prioritize based on the needs. We're saying the first swath would be the fire alarms. Um, not a huge dollar amount, per se, across the whole district, uh, but we would expect those roofs to be more year five or six that we would have enough money put aside for those. Um, so yeah, that's, <coughs> fortunately, once we deal with the immediate issues we have with roof at the high school, we don't feel there's anything that's, uh, you know, really requiring us to, to act on that in the next two or three years. So that would be more of a priority three or four. Uh, and, and plus we need to raise the money. We need to get the money up. So that's kind of works out okay. okay. So we think, we think we can do it in bite-sized pieces and still deal with uh, those larger issues. With regards to some of these projects, there's, mm -hmm. there's quite a few here, um, I know that Well, actually, we we're kind of now operating. Um, I think the day-to-day -day operations, I feel, are going very well. Uh, something like this, though, the district would have some options. It, oftentimes, uh, the district may hire a clerk of the works for a large job. So it's specific to the capital project. We don't feel we necessarily need somebody on the day-to-day -to, -day to worry about the cleaning and the upkeep and the you know, ombudsmanship and working with the principals. But clearly, we may want to have somebody on board who's looking, especially when we're doing roof projects. But the first year or two where it's, you know, fire alarms, we feel that we probably have the staffing right now to be able to oversee that kind of work. And the architects are also going to be helping with some. But part of the 10 million can be used for what's known as soft costs. And that could include something like Clark of the Works. But right now, we don't see the, the need in the next year or two to require a Clark of the Works to be brought in. Or a construction manager. Some districts hire a, a separate firm like your uh, Turner Construction Savin, these are national companies where they come in and help you manage the capital project because it kind of sits on its own. It doesn't affect the day-to-day -day operations of the district, overseeing staff per se. But it's a good point. I mean, uh, when we get to these bigger jobs, we, we may be coming back to the, the board for those positions, which are temporary. They, they only last as long as the capital project lasts. And then there would be an analysis done. Is it better to go with yeah, I think that's a, that's a reasonable thing, and yes, we should be able to do uh, positives and negatives. But right now, we are operating without that position being filled on a day-to-day -day basis, and even looking at some of the capital projects in the next summer, and we feel we have the staff that can handle it internally right now without bringing in consultants or additional staff. Thank you. If possible, um, Dr. Adams, and, uh, and we, if we can, at that point where you feel we're at the turning point, where the, the magnitude of the projects is mm -hmm. possibly going to require consulting hires or part-time hires or full-time hires, maybe we can financially compare, you know, the pros and cons to one or the other, yeah. um, because as you know, it's been a concern, you know, <coughs> if we can have that much uh, of a list of projects you know, at what point does it become more cost effective or at least, um, you know, the loyalty and the presence in the, in the district as opposed to, you know, coming in and out. Yeah. Well,
I, I have more questions, but sure. does any, do we want to finish up anything on the uh, capital reserve? Or no. Properties? Okay. Good? Okay. So I, I've got a few questions, but no. we'll start with, um, with tax service. Yeah. So we had a brief discussion earlier, um, and I, I'd like to understand how you're budgeting for tax service this year, um, considering the largest property as well. Mm -hmm. So could you elaborate? Yeah. Um, obviously, they're our biggest taxpayer. Uh, it's a very important uh, uh, taxpayer for us. If uh, the sale price that's been mentioned ends up being the true sale price, that's about 60% less than what their current assessment would yield as a of market value. So that taxpayer is paying $1.3 million a year. So that comes out to something like $780,000 if that's how much um, that assessment dropped. Now, we're not sure right now. May 1st is the taxable status date. Actually, it's March 1st, but then it gets finalized May 1st. We're not sure what, what assessment the assessor is putting on Novartis for next year anyway. Is it going to be less? I mean, everyone knows this is what's being talked about. So if it's brought down an assessment brought down a little bit, then that 780,000 would be affected. But basically it's another, uh, right now my thought is if uh, that we would have to reserve money for a potential settlement with Novartis if, their tax, if there's a tax or issue for a second year. We fortunately settled recently a litigation that might give us some money to help towards, towards that, some revenue that we hadn't planned on. But it could be as much as seven hundred eighty thousand dollars of just that property's tax or loan. Um, so for the, I'm sorry, for the seventeen eighteen budget, what do you anticipate budgeting for tax service overall? Is, we have very little that's budgeted for tax service. We've set up a reserve just kind of like we did for capital uh, and, projects. And, and how much is in that reserve? Over, 16, but we'll get you the exact number. But it's it's in the teens okay. of million. And let's just say, again, hypothetically, let's say it's 16. Yep. Do you have potential potential payouts tied to those costs? Oh, we have to. Yeah, I mean, it has so to be a, a specific list. million dollars worth of potential. Yeah, we can have actually, that's a list we have to give to the auditors okay. and provide to the board that this is what they are. Okay. They're all, they have to be actual claims that are out there for, okay. you know. With court docket numbers so and so forth. Okay, but that, that can all be made available? Oh, yeah, most definitely. And yep. that you look at every three years, right? Is that the, the well, every year we have to roll off the ones that have passed or settled. And uh, and then obviously we bring new ones on. Unfortunately, there's usually a box of them every summer that come in. Now, we well, budget for small say, claims. We can budget for small claims in the budget. Those uh, the, the old ones come back that weren't resolved. Yeah, I think there's a three-year hiatus after a settlement where right. I can't come back. But uh, if you're not settled, I, I think the ones you're concerned. Come back on too. Right. Yes. So that's they true. keep rolling over. Yes, they could. Our biggest concern we've talked internally is if Novartis drags on for years and years. You know, without a settlement, without either a sale or a settlement, that's when you know, like our neighbors in North Rock, that's when you get, tend to get bigger problems because. It's in multiple years, so uh, <coughs> right now we feel it's manageable in the bigger picture because of the reserve that has been set up. But we're gonna we're gonna look to add to that reserve for uh, this upcoming year. So that's a definitely another uh, wait. Even before we get to the capital reserve, we're gonna have to fund that. That's twenty eighteen. Twenty nineteen. Twenty nineteen. Twenty nineteen. When we would up the reserve. 2018, 2019, we would look at upping the reserve? Not now. Well, actually, when we close out this this fiscal year, this summer, this summer, this summer, we may bring the, you know, by then we'll have the new claims, too. We'll know exactly what Novartis' claim is for 17, 18 taxes. So better estimates. Yeah, we'll have that by August. So it'll be part of that, our summer planning. Okay, thank you. The actual number that we get every year, if you remember that um, in, in July and August, we get in July and August, you usually get um, the actual tax service. And if you remember, we brought down these books, and that's what we still have. Because many of them are still outstanding. They're years sometimes to clear. So um, so we have all of that. But they're all actual certs. Like you said, some roll over. We look at them every year. It's not 
the plant, they say to look them at every three years. We don't do that. Every year when those are settled, we take them out, we put the new ones in mm -hmm. every year. So we have books and books of this. Yeah. But you'll see the background to our reserve. It was provided to provide that to you. Okay. Um, I have another question regarding food service. Okay. Oh. Completely changed the record. Yeah, okay. Um, when, when, when you provided at the last workshop the expenditures and, and you have, you know, your, wherever you have, nine or ten categories, where does food service fall? What what category is that? Like the good thing is that's a self-supporting operation. It's off budget. So it's not. It's a revenue. It re it's self-supporting. It, it is part of when we do the audit this summer, we will highlight it. Mm -hmm. It's been financially successful. It actually has a, I think we have 600,000 fund balance, something like that. So they, they have a fund balance. And they're using some of that to do help us do the high school cafeteria. They help contribute to that. Um, but uh, it, they sit off budget, so um, all those costs, while they're while they go through our accounts, there's no tax payer or contribution to that, and it's not part of the general fund budget. It's like federal funds are the same. Exactly. You have some things off budget. Is, is it is it um, is it accounted for in the same way though? I mean, is it, it does it have its own? Yes. You know, ledger? Does it it does, yep. And okay. it's uh, primarily it's we're totally contracting. Separate. Yeah, we have very few employees. We, uh, it's another fund. Yeah. So yeah. it's like the A fund, mm -hmm. general fund is the A fund. Sorry. General fund is the A fund. The school lunch is the C fund. It's a so total separate cost. We cannot lose money in it. That's that's the law. And we're taking that money and putting it back into the food service. Okay. And our primary expense there, primary expense is contractual with the contracted firm. Right. With their employees are actually providing. So we don't Which have to totally the mark. Yes. Mm -hmm. The hour mark every few years it has to be reevaluated, rebid. And, uh, yes. how, and how often do you bid out that contract? Every three years or five? Five. Five. Okay. And they just, what, two years ago, I think they redid it. Okay, so they'll be up for, they'll be up for bid again for, I guess, for 18, 19. Maybe 1920. We and again, and any time the district can decide to bid it out, but as long as you stay within CPI, the district is allowed mm -hmm. to just roll that existing and bring it over. Um, okay, and we expect it to continue to be profitable, so there's there's no drain on the district. There are some districts that have to contribute to the school lunch fund, but we don't. We aren't. I have a question about the cafeteria. Yeah. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the cafeteria is um, so we had talked before at board meeting about the high school and middle school cafeterias um, yeah. upgrades or updates. Yeah. Um, and so there's that surplus that we're going to use to remodel and renovate the high school cafeteria, if I'm not mistaken. And then is there other state funding or how is it funded overall? Yeah, the, um, we're going to do the high school cafeteria in probably two phases. Right now it's going to be the, uh, I think they call it the snack area is going to be redone, but then the the larger area is actually part of the 17, you know, potential list of uh, capital projects we will uh, look to undertake over the next 10 years. That will, let me get the list of what that's going to entail. So our hope is we can actually start, we can do phase one in the summer. We're waiting for a building permit from the state on that. And that was 400000 that was budgeted for last year, and the school lunch fund helped us fund that. <laughs> Um, but the, I know the two other areas. Yeah, I was going to be a question because I thought we would have started that already, though it sounded like we were it's ready to go. It's back to these building permits are taking so a long time challenge. to get from SED. Okay. So um, you almost have to plan a year before to, but we think, we're being told we should be expected to do that work this summer. But that's about 40% of the total work we'd like to ultimately do there. And so we need to use a budgeted uh, part of the capital fund for the rest of the cafeteria. Yeah, and we may get some help from, from the cafeteria fund for that. We may put that, like we did last year, in the budget, but bring in revenue from the cafeteria fund to help offset it. And do we have an overall uh, expectation of what the whole project would cost? Um, it's a million total, so it's 400000 is what was set aside now. And we're, we're setting aside 600000 for phase two. So as part of this um, project, maybe someone else can answer, I don't know, but I'm asking you all those questions. As part of it is um, to encourage um, our students to actually use the space because it's not well used. 
um, or adequately or sufficiently used, or what is the goal? Or is it just beautification, making it more pleasant? Is it outdated? Is it falling apart? What are we hoping to do? We had a list of the, all the positives. Definitely more options for kids, definitely healthier foods for kids. Um, but I, I, I think we can put that together. It's back, also not ADA, I believe. Exactly. Yeah. It's also not ADA. Right. Yeah. So we can do it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any Neither's the other one, but that's the for a later date. Okay. <laughs> At the last workshop, mm -hmm. we had talked a bit about um, evaluating each department, evaluating their budgets, mm -hmm. and I know Princess told was out. Um, so we did talk briefly about principals being um, responsible for their own buildings, mm -hmm. but I, I had inquired about a little more detail about within the departments, you know, who's reviewing specific line items, just to make sure, and again, and I'm not looking for micromanage, it's not the purpose. Um, my goal is just to make sure that if money's being allocated in a certain area, historically, that's not being used, who's reviewing it to make sure that, you know, to say that, you know, there's money sitting here that could be put somewhere else to better use. So has any of that information been made available? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is a decentralized process at the building levels. Obviously, elementary schools are grade levels, but secondary, the high, middle school, uh, they have coordinators you know, by ELA, math, science, that they get in, input from. As far as what they need, they look at multi-years. And what I heard at the, at the high school is it's the same, but on departmental level. So as part of their regular departmental meetings, budget is one of the areas that's discussed, especially when it gets into the spring. Again, I believe certain APs work with different departments, uh, that's how they split that responsibility up, and then everything funnels back up. Also, when we're sitting with the principal, if we see lines that don't have much activity or have been underspent, we either kind of question, can we reduce this? Is there a reason? Yeah. And oftentimes we hear either that there's a, a cycle of purchasing, so sometimes at the end of the year is when finally the textbook committees have their decisions made as to what they're going to be yeah. doing for the next year. The textbook one is an interesting one because yeah. you brought it up last time. Yeah, less. that that costs have been declining. It's been what? Well, yeah, the 16-17 budget, the 17-18 budget is less, and what we're going to spend in 16-17 is less than what we budgeted. Um, so that's what I was okay. going to because I found you know I found it interesting regarding textbooks as an example that the costs rose in fact from 15 to 16 mm -hmm. and then the budget and they agreed to about four percent and then from 16 to this current school year that line rose 11 and a half percent so yeah. right and I guess that's my point is we raised that budget line 11 and a half percent but we're not going to spend that money the state's given us more flexibility with things like Chromebooks or can be used as textbooks um, software so there it's become more fluid than it used to be so i think that's also what kind of what we're seeing but definitely this year what we heard from the principals at the elementary level was the idea of more equipment more furnishing for some of the new rooms they want to do tinker spaces mm -hmm. and they felt they can go a little lighter on some their libraries and things so i think it's just trends but uh we could do a multi-year on um, you know on, on those instructional materials and kind of uh, boil it down the reduction, though, from 17 18 is real in textbooks compared to 16 okay. 17. Again, I, I'm just looking overall. Yeah. You know, Can I just say one thing? We're going to focus on textbooks. I'm looking yeah. the whole you focus gotta remember on, that we're getting aid on this as well. So you're not going to underspend the textbooks, the software, because we are getting dollar aid. And if we don't spend that, we don't get the money. So, and because, like Anthony said, we could reallocate this money, we could reallocate money between textbooks, software, and hardware. The state allows, even though it might show up one way on the expenditures, when we go into the SD3, there's different parts, we reallocate that to maximize our aid. So you might see that it seems like it's, it's a large number, yeah. but that's because we're maximizing the aid of the state. Sure, I, I understand. And I'm not, again, I'm not trying to harp on textbooks. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just trying to make the point with the textbooks as an example. And you can use uh, any number of items in the, in the general ledger. You could use library services, you could use you know, any host of things that have been underspent by 50% of their budget. 
part of uh, I mean, part of our budgeting is we do want to spend less than what we budget, so that we have the ability, flexibility to deal with things at the end of the year. Also, so I mean, we if we that is part of what we are. We don't want to be surprised on the, the, the other side. You know, utility costs. You know, they've come in considerably less the last few years. We've been lucky in some winters and stuff. But we still are budgeting a worst case mm -hmm. winter coming up. And I don't expect, we expect maybe get 50 to 100,000 out of that line if it's, a, if it's like the kind of we just did. So it's, you, as long as all the things don't break against you, you know, um, there's going to be these plays where some things are coming in over, some things are coming in under. But we can uh, we can give a breakdown of the analysis of any you know in more detail than what you see here if you want to get to that level. The board. I just want to know that they're being looked at and evaluated. Yeah, they are. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.